Welcome back to our message series called Reality Check as we look at the very, various important ways that, that God gives us reality check right when we need it. One of those TV news magazine shows was doing an expose on hotel cleanliness. And so a reporter was walking into hotel rooms with a black light. And the purple glow of this truth detecting light was illuminating all kinds of germs and stains in the room, glowing brightly neon on carpet and bedspread. Yuck. Well, one of the more disturbing scenes of the particular show was when the reporter was hanging out in the hotel lobby and he cornered an unsuspecting couple on their vacation. And he asked if they'd be willing to submit their hotel room to one of his black light experiments. And you're kind of like hoping they just say no and tell him to leave. But this poor couple said yes. I don't know if they knew that was going to end up ruining their vacation. And so the husband and wife crowded into an elevator together with the reporter and the whole camera crew going up to the hotel room. And the reporter um, held back any indication that he knew what might happen when they got into the room. And the the poor couple was just completely oblivious, just kind of making small talk about their trip. So they all walked in the hotel room, opened the door, the lights were on, and everything looked pristine as if it had, like, just been cleaned or maybe even was brand new and never been used before. Maybe, you know, maybe this was going to be the one hotel room that somehow passed the test. The lights were turned off. And then there was kind of like a moment of silence, like in a horror movie, when you know something bad is about to happen. And then the black light was flipped on. And stains and germs showed up everywhere. Unbelievably, it was worse than all the other rooms uh, that were shown previously. Worse than all put together, there was neon, bright neon glowing everywhere, including a suspiciously large stain on the carpet. The couple panicked. The wife began to scream over and over again. Turn that off! Turn that off! Turn that off! When it was, when it was obvious that the reporter was not going to turn the black light off, the wife rushed over to the regular light switch and turned the lights back on, the big lights. And everything looked completely normal again. She began to calm down, emitted a little bit of nervous laughter, and she said, there. That's better. But here's the thing. The stains were still there. The couple could no longer see the stains, but that didn't change the reality of the stains' existence. The word for this is denial. Okay, denial is is turning the black light off in an effort to make the stains disappear. Denial is pretending that everything is okay, even though everything is not okay. Denial is a defense mechanism. When a, a person is faced with a fact that is, that is too, um, too uncomfortable to accept, and so they reject it, despite overwhelming evidence. So instead of brutal honesty, many of us have often chosen continued denial. The the reality, we've been confronted with a reality so uncomfortable um, that we choose to continue living in false reality. For example, what is the number one way that people respond to a bill they get in the mail that they're not able to pay. They don't open it. 
the reality is too uncomfortable to deal with, so they pretend that everything is okay. Women who have a family history of breast cancer are sometimes the least likely to get a mammogram. Men with a family history of heart disease often ignore the warning signs. People who are spiritually separating themselves from God way too often ignore his loving warnings. The truth is too uncomfortable. The evidence may be there. It might even be overwhelming. But our response often is, turn that off. Well, in our text, the background of our text is this. Way back in the history of God's people, God had rescued his people from Egypt, and he, and he promised them a new home, a new land. And as he was bringing them into that new land, he told them to avoid, stay away from, and drive out the people who are worshiping false idols and false gods. Because he knew, he, he, he didn't want their hearts to be drawn away from him and toward those other things. And God knew the damage that would happen if something else were to be first in their hearts. The Bible talks about how God is a jealous God. He's a jealous God who wants our hearts to belong to him because he loves us and because he knows what's best for us. And see, he knows how dangerous it would be for us to let other things take his place in our hearts. And so he warns us to stay away And that's what he warned his people to do. Stay away from that. Stay away from those idols. Stay away from those things that are going to draw you away from me. Stay away from that. It's more powerful than you are. Stay away. But despite all long history, got to read a big chunk of the Old Testament, despite all of the miracles God did for them, despite all of the victories God won for them, what happened? When things got tough, when times got tough, what they do, they didn't really trust God. They started turning to false gods. And it would often happen like this. If there was a very menacing, powerful army threatening their borders, they would smuggle in and and sneak a few of that army's favorite idols. They were hedging their bets just in case their God didn't bring them, their own God didn't bring them success. Or they would start worshiping Baal. Baal's the God of crops and fertility. They would start worshiping the God of Baal, just in case maybe that would help their crops grow better. They were trying to have all their bases covered. Sound familiar? I mean, maybe an idol will help. Maybe not, but why not make sure? We hedge our bets. We make sure all of our bases are covered. We have insurance. Just in case that doesn't work out, let's have plan B. They had a lot of plan Bs, and they, they looked to a lot of other sources than God to take care of them as he promised he would. And so God's people drifted from idol to idol. They, they adopted the gods of the groups around them, particularly the ones um, who were having the most success in armies and agriculture. If, if their gods were helping them in those areas, particularly our, uh, army, their armies and their agriculture, they would adopt those gods. But it didn't help them. We know the story. We know the history. It didn't help them. It brought more trouble. And what happened is their trust in God disappeared. It waned and waned and waned and disappeared. God loved them. <laughs> And he he wanted to bring them back. And so God sent warning after warning after warning. God shined the black light on their stains. God sent prophet after prophet after prophet to shine that black light, to warn them, to show them the danger of what they were doing. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micaiah, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, prophet after prophet. But they didn't like listening to those prophets. Kings would say stuff like, he never prophesies anything good about me, only bad things about me. So I don't want to listen to him. The people didn't like hearing Jeremiah's warnings. They loved listening to the false prophet Hananiah's speaking about peace and love and everything's going to be okay. But they didn't like listening to Jeremiah. So God sent prophet after prophet, warning after warning. 
But the people ignored the warnings. The people said, turn that off. Don't want to see that. Don't want to hear that. And so they silenced the prophets. They imprisoned them. They sawed them in half. They were living in denial. They ignored God's word of warning. So it was time for, finally, a reality check. And the reality check was going to come with the nation of Assyria, the most powerful and brutal nation on earth. After a long line of kings, King Hoshea was going to be the, finally the last king of Israel. After all these years, after all these evil kings making God upset, turning the people away from him, and the people following that, after all the warnings, God kept his word. So here's our text from 2 Kings 17, which describes ultimately the end of the kingdom of Israel. The the two nations, there's Israel and Judah. The kingdom had split into Israel and Judah. This is going to be the northern kingdom of Israel. This is finally the end for them as the Assyrian nation comes in and carries them off. The king of Assyria invaded the entire land, marched against Samaria, and laid siege to it for three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. He settled them in Hala, in Gozan, on the Habor River, and in the town, towns of the Medes. All this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of Egypt from under the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. They worshiped other gods and followed the practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before them, as well as the practices that the kings of Israel had introduced. The Israelites secretly did things against the Lord their God that were not right. From watchtower to fortified city, they built themselves high places in all their towns. They set up sacred stones and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree, At every high place they burned incense, as the nations whom the Lord had driven out before them had done. They did wicked things that aroused the Lord's anger. They worshipped idols, though the Lord had said, you shall not do this. The Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and seers, turn from your evil ways, observe my commands and decrees in accordance with the entire law that I commanded your ancestors to obey, that I delivered you through my servants, the prophets. But they would not listen and were as stiff-necked as their ancestors who did not trust in the Lord their God. They rejected his decrees and the covenant he had made with their ancestors and the statutes he had warned them to keep. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. They imitated the nations around them, although the Lord had ordered them, do not do as they do. And so they were carried off to Assyria, who did not treat them well at all. And this was the end. We never hear anything again about the northern tribes of Israel. And all this damage, all of this damage, because they ignored God's word of warning. They were living in denial that there was anything wrong with the way they were living and what they were doing and what they were following. So do we? Do we often live in denial that we are harming our relationship with God? Ignoring his warnings? When we ignore God's warnings, God's word, and live in denial, we are harming our relationship with him. So we're going to talk about that today. We we, we know we have God's word. We have his warnings. Um, why do we sometimes not listen to them? Why do we sometimes ignore them? And it often has to do with denial. So we're going to look at three different tactics of denial. The first tactic is disagreement. Okay, we disagree, not because of facts. We disagree because of what we want to be true. So, for example, a young man came home from his first year of college. And he went and, and he, he, had a, he, talked to, he had a conversation with his pastor. He said, Pastor, I've been, I've been studying the Bible a lot. And I've come to the conclusion that sex before marriage is not a sin. 
And then he gave his reasonings as to why he had come to that conclusion. The pastor listened. And then the pastor showed him a number of Scripture passages that, that showed otherwise. So the young man said, well, well, maybe that's the way it was, you know, that's what it meant for them at that time. But a lot has changed. A lot has changed. And so I don't think what was true for them is true for us today. It's a cultural difference. See, here's the thing. That this young man knew what was right. He knew what was right, but he wanted to disagree so that he could live in denial about what he was doing. So the pastor said, let me make a guess here. I'm guessing that you were raised in a home where you were taught that sex outside of marriage was against God's will for our lives, right? And the young man said, yes, yes, I grew up thinking it was a sin, but I don't think it's a sin anymore. So the pastor said, can I make one more guess? I'm guessing... I'm guessing at college you've gotten yourself a girlfriend and you're sleeping with her. Is that true? And there was silence. And finally he said, well, yeah, but that has nothing to do with this. Okay, that's denial. That's denial. We tell ourselves lies because the lie is more convenient to believe. Blaise Pascal said it this way, people usually arrive at their beliefs not on basis of proof, but on basis of what they find attractive. So we're willing to, we're willing to lie to ourselves. We're willing to, to lie to ourselves about our reality and about what we believe if that means then that we can have something that we want. A reality check from God leads us to admit this. It leads us to confess this. A reality check from God leads us to agree with the truth. A reality check from God leads us to stop disagreeing with the truth because disagreement is the first tactic of denial. Second tactic would be defensiveness. Defensiveness. We get defensive if there's an area of our life that we know is out of line, but we, we really want to ignore just as an example of defensiveness, let's say you have a friend who is in, like, perfect physical shape. Now, they're a kind person. They're a nice person who cares about you. But when they ask you, completely not out of judgment, just out of kindness and genuine concern, when they ask, so how is your uh, diet and exercise routine going, you get defensive. And you rip off something, like, well, how is your love life? Or how is, your, how is it life in an unemployment line? Or how is your favorite team doing? Or, or, or something that will try to make them feel as inferior as they just made you feel, even though they had no intention to do so. We get defensive if there's an area of our life that's out of line. But we want to kind of ignore that area. It's even more true spiritually. Defensiveness often reveals an area of our life that we're in denial. And here, here's the proof. We, we, avoid, we avoid people and places that force us to be brutally honest. It, it's why a lot of people stop going to church or stay away from church, because church is a great place that forces us to be brutally honest. Can't tell you how many stories like this I hear. Um, when, I, when I went to college, I started partying, and I, I guess that was about the time that I stopped going to church. Or I started dating this guy, and I guess it was shortly after that that I kind of stopped going to church. Or my marriage was really struggling and, and failing, and it was about the time that I filed for divorce that, that, I, that I stopped going to church. Okay, they, they, they avoided the people and places that might confront them with the truth about who they were or what they were doing or that, that area of life that they were living in denial about. And so that's, that's how we often respond to the stain of sin in our lives. The light of God's Word illuminates them. It shines light on them. It shows them, and, and we recognize, oh, look at those stains. But we don't want to deal with them. And so 
we try keeping God's light, like turn that off. We try keeping God's light from shining into every corner of our lives. And, and so we can pretend, so we can turn the lights off, turn the big lights on, pretend everything's okay. So we like to defend ourselves and get defensive instead of being honest. So we have disagreement, we have defensiveness, and we have, the third one is distraction. It's easier to live in denial about one part of um, our life if, if all the other parts are going well. So if the other parts of our life can just kind of distract us long enough, we won't think about that, that one area of life that it'll be easier to live in denial about. I think a, maybe a TV show um, shows this kind of well. There, there's a TV show called uh, Kitchen Nightmares that featured where a world-class chef um, will walk into restaurants that basically are living nightmares. So um, they need help. But they, they, don't, they don't always see it right away because maybe, maybe the restaurant, maybe it's very um, attractive looking outside. Maybe the location is right. Maybe there's a nice welcoming, friendly atmosphere in there, and they have some things like that going. But the problem is always the same. The problem is that the food is nasty. And so Chef Gordon Ramsay comes in, and he has to show them how nasty the food is. And it often takes a while because they're living in denial. Because they're distracted by everything else. They're distracted by managing the food orders, uh, overseeing the wait staff, um, maybe mingling with the customers, anything but making good food. So we can distract ourselves with so many things in life that we can then ignore that one area we want to live in denial over. Distracting ourselves keeps us in denial. So the workaholic, the workaholic gets a job promotion, earns salesman of the year, just nailing it at the office, but seems to be completely oblivious that his teenage son is smoking weed and his wife is basically feeling completely all alone. Or the, the, the mother keeps a beautiful home perfectly decorated. She's always decorating, always cleaning. It always looks like something out of a magazine. But she seems to be completely oblivious to the fact that her children walk right into their rooms and shut the door. Or a 20-something knows like every single, you know, TV show reference, every pop culture reference, all, all whatever is the latest and whatever, but has zero does not seem to notice, has zero knowledge or awareness that, that all of his relationships are getting more and more shallow. And they're no longer even based on anything that actually matters. Spiritually for us, here's what happens. Other things in our lives take God's place in our hearts. That's what an idol is anyway. We spent weeks on that last fall. Other things take God's place in our hearts. They, they fill our lives up. They, they distract us. They, 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 they occupy every moment, every second of our time. And so you and I can fill our lives with so much noise. There can be so much noise in our lives that with all the things that we distract ourselves, with all the things that we occupy, with all the things taking place in our hearts, with all that noise going on, we're not even able to hear God's voice in his warnings. When we're living in denial, we need a reality check from God. The thing is, we have a loving God. He's not trying to give us a reality check to spite us and see how much it destroys our lives. God gives us reality check because he's drawing us closer to him. When God gives us warnings, he is always lovingly call, calling people back to trust in him. I love these words that the prophet Hosea, one of those guys giving warnings, tells the people this. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. The Bible says that God is a jealous God. 
we usually think jealous is bad. But this is not a bad thing. The fact that God is a jealous God is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. He wants your loyalty. He wants your life. He wants your heart. He's jealous for that. And he showed that he was willing to go out of his way to get it. No matter how many, no matter how many idols, no matter how many false gods you have pursued and run after, he has not stopped pursuing you. And he will never stop pursuing you. He keeps warning you and me in love, patiently calling you and me back to him to put him first in our hearts. And the faster that you run away from God, the faster he's going to run after you because he loves you more than anything else, more than anything else. He wants you to know that he loves you. And this God who loves you, he wants the best for you. It's why we talk to the kids about why parents might warn us. They want the best for us. This God who loves us warns us because he wants the best for us. He wants the best for us. He wants to bring us to heaven so we can trust him. Some of you here today, maybe, maybe you're hesitant to trust because maybe you've been burned before. Maybe your trust has been broken. Maybe you've been let down by people who've broken your trust. But you can trust God. And here's why you can trust God. Because he gave his own son for you. The God of the universe, the God who created the entire universe, he wants a personal relationship with you, a personal relationship with you. And in order to make that happen, the only way that he could make that happen is by sending Jesus, his son, to come here and live here and die for you and me. That's why we can trust him. That's why we know that he loves us. And Jesus willingly and obediently and perfectly did that for us. So now God's black light test shows no stains in our lives at all. None. His test only shows the perfection of Jesus in our lives. And that means that we get to be part of God's people. We get to be part of God's family forever. So yeah, sometimes God warns us when we're going astray from his truth. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. We need it. So don't, um, let's not ignore it. Let's welcome it. Let's welcome it. Because God is our loving Father. And if he didn't love us, well, then I guess he would let us have all kinds of idols in our hearts that would harm us. But God loves us way too much for that. We need to hear this message. This is why this church is here. This is why this school is here. This is why we're, we're installing some new teachers today to share that message with the children they teach so that we all together can share this message with the community we teach because we need to know about this God who loves us way too much to allow other things take his place in our hearts. So if, if God is giving you some warning signs in your life right now, don't ignore them. Don't run away from him. Run to him. Listen to him. Trust him. Let's pray. Lord, you have certainly given us some reality checks in our lives. Things haven't always gone smoothly. And when, when we're straying from you, we often feel your hand on us, pulling us back, drawing us back to you. Help us not try to run farther or faster. Help us listen. Help us listen knowing that in your, in your discipline, in your warning, in your words, in whatever's going on, that, that you love us and are just drawing us back to you. Help us know that. Comfort everyone in here today with the truth of your love, of your grace, of, of the lengths that you went through to make us your children 
and to draw us back to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.